Okay, hi everyone. Mrs. Hudson now, chapter 25. Very exciting. This is the last but one chapter. So we're getting to that point where it's coming pretty much to the end, the conclusion of the whole story, um, just leaving us for the very last little bit. And who knows um, what, how the last little bit will leave it for us. We do know that uh, Cogheart is one of a set of stories, so um, we're perhaps thinking that there's more to come from this. We'll see what happens in today's chapter for you, chapter 25. Robert, Malkin and John dropped through the broken porthole and crawled out from under the airship's belly onto the roof of Big Ben, which was sleeked with rain. The hulking frame of the Zeppelin burned above them, it was fast collapsing into a smoking inferno. Gigantic o's of fire burst across its surface and flames licked up the last flecks of silk and canvas, pulling them free to drift off across the night sky. Only the ship's metal hull and its forest of spikes protected them from the falling debris. That and the fact that the wind was blowing the fire and flames away from the tower yet still the heat was intense. It pulsed in waves through Robert's body until he could barely think straight. Then, through the haze, he made out Professor Silverfish and Lily halfway up the steep sloping roof. Lily screamed and kicked at the professor, but he dragged her over the balustrade of a balcony. Robert, John and Malkin clambered towards them as they disappeared through a tall gold leaf arch into the interior of Big Ben's spire. As they skirted a line of guttering, another roar of gas exploded from the Zeppelin's envelope. A whoosh of escaping fire scalded Robert's cheeks. Rivets popped from Beermoth's heated metal plates and pinged past them. They hunkered against the tiles and Robert glanced down. On the ground beneath the tower, firemen and police rushed across Parliament Square towards the blaze. The drop made Robert's head spin and he almost tripped over the edge of the roof. But John gripped his arm and pulled him onward. They battled through the steaming rain and reached the balustrade where they'd seen Lily and Silverfish disappear. Climbing over it, they ran towards the gold-leafed arches. The inside of the roof was furnace hot. Sweat ran down Robert's back as he, John and Malkin hobbled down the spiral steps towards the belfry of the tower. Following the sound of the professor's echoing footsteps, with each spiral they descended. The sloped ceiling opened out and the noise of the huge clock's mechanisms grew louder. They passed the tip of the great tin and copper bell of Big Ben, hung in the vaulted roof alongside its four smaller brothers, and arrived on a gantry at the base of the belfry, where echoing ticks were joined by the deafening grind of cogs that floated up from somewhere beneath them. Robert's pulse beat time with a myriad of clockwork. The noises reminded him of his dar's workshop before the fire, before everything stopped. But this was a thousand times stronger. He looked about for the professor and Lily. Behind the skirts of the bells, four identical clock dials filled the walls, and far below the metal gantry on which they stood, four sets of mechanisms radiated out from the central timekeeper, their gargantuan cogs and springs clicking and rotating in unison. A bullet zinged past Robert's ear. He bobbed under the rim of the great bell, dragging John and Malkin along behind him. Four more bullets exploded off the outside of the immense dome. Then the gun was silent. It's empty, John said. They scrambled out from their hiding place and a flash of red caught Robert's eye in the darkness. Lily's hair. A few feet away, she and the professor were silhouetted against the nearest clock face like slides in a magic lantern show. As they passed in front of its vast patterned panes, Professor Silverfish fidgeted with the empty pistol. His other hand muffled Lily's mouth. She kicked at his shins, fighting back. Robert ran at the professor and knocked the gun from his hand. He grasped at the machine on the man's chest, pulling at the tubes, trying to loosen them. But the professor fought back. Robert stumbled, his elbow cracked against the rail of the gantry, making his teeth jitter. John was right behind. 
He balled a fist and jabbed at the professor. The professor shoved Lily aside to swing at him. John stepped back and tried to weave away, but Silverfish caught him with a right hook, smacking his head against the bell with a clang. John fell, clutching at his temple, blood dripping through his fingers. Lily swayed unsteadily, clasping a hand to her chest. As Robert reached out to her, the professor turned quickly and grabbed her again. Malkin darted forward, snapping at his heels, sinking his teeth into the man's leg. Get away from me, you can confounded mechanimal! Silverfish kicked Malkin aside and grappled Lily back into his grip. Robert dived at the professor again, clinging to the lumpy device on his chest and throwing punches around it, while Lily yanked at the pipes in an attempt to loosen them. The professor cursed and swung his arms wildly, but they clung on. He stepped back, clasping at a broken length of rail, but it gave way, and all three of them toppled off the open end of the gantry. The impact knocked the wind from Robert's body. He lay teetering on a ledge. He gasped, clawed himself upright, and found himself standing on a narrow metal beam, barely wider than his feet, that ran from the gigantic machinery of the tower into the big centre of the clock face. In front of him, the professor rose slowly. and Behind him, Lily clambered up from where she'd landed. Robert was the only thing that stood between the two of them. The professor edged towards him. You can't win, you know. You haven't the wits. Robert's old fears bubbled up. Perhaps the man was right. He glanced over the edge of the metal beam into the abyss below. Lily coughed, trying to catch her breath. Robert took her hand. Far beneath them, the sharp gears of the timekeeper shifted with a click. After all he'd been through, he didn't know if he could do this. It felt as if he still had so far to fall, but then he remembered Dar's words. No one conquers fear easily, Robert. It takes a brave heart to win great battles. I've heart enough, he murmured. What? the professor asked. He spoke the words louder. I said, I've heart enough to win this battle. He squared off against the professor, driving his shoulder into him. But the professor seemed to have gathered extra strength. He danced nimbly on his feet, forcing Robert and Lily down the length of the beam until they were pressed up against the glass clock face. Careful! Lily said, and Robert felt her arm around his waist. Grasped against her, he could sense her heart drumming wildly through the back of his chest. The shadows on Big Ben's two gigantic hands hung above them on the exterior glass, which crackled and warped from the outside heat. Professor Silverfish lunged, shoving Robert's head against a triangular pane, trying to force him down from the beam. But Lily clung on tight. She wouldn't let go. She wouldn't let him fall. Crack! Splinters of glass sliced into Robert's ears as his head smashed into the pane. Blood trickled down his face and dripped onto his shoe. There was no escape. He glanced down once more and felt sick. The drop was at least 20 feet to the VI of the clock face and another 30 to the sharp-looking mechanisms and cogs that turned below at the heart of the tower. Then he noticed something. The beam they stood on went out through a hole at the centre of the clock dial. An image of the insides of his Dar's timepieces came to him. The movement mechanisms, the centre wheel, the rod which runs from there to move the hands on the face. Of course, they were standing on that rod. That beam. Any second now, it would turn the minute hand of the clock. Gritting his teeth, he reached up and gripped the corner of the broken pane of glass with his fingers. Hold on to me tight, Lily, he whispered. Any second now. Out of my way, boy! Professor Silverfish threw his full weight onto Robert. He was so close, Robert could smell the stench of his breath behind his big yellow teeth. But he wasn't holding on to anything. The minute must nearly be up. Robert grasped the broken corner of glass tighter. Pain coursed through him till he could barely stand it. Click! 
The beam shifted the hands of the clock, twisting under them. Professor Silverfish staggered back, his feet slipping, his arms waving, thrashing the air. He'd lost his balance, and the weight of his heart machine poured him over the edge. His eyes wide with horror, his fingertips brushed the end of Robert's arm, and he fell. Robert heard his echoing scream, then a sickening crunch and the grinding of gears. The tick of the clock and the clatter of movement juddered to a stop. He and Lily stared down into the darkness beneath them, where the professor's body and his machine were mangled in the gigantic stilled cogs of the clock. I think he's dead, Lily shuddered, letting out a sigh of relief. She loosened her grip on his waist and Robert found he could breathe once more. He grasped a great lungful of air and let go of the broken pain he'd been clasping. The clock had stopped. Without the noise of its cogs turning, the room felt eerily silent. Robert took Lily's hand in his and they stumbled along the stilled beam and up onto the safety of the gantry. Where's Malkin and Papa? Lily asked as Robert helped her up beside him. As if in answer, John scrambled to his feet behind the rim of the bell, rubbing his head. Malkin yapped and lolloped beside him, butting him gently to his feet. Lily, John exclaimed, you're all right. And he ran over and hugged her, enveloping her in his arms. Malkin's ears pricked up and he jumped crazily in circles around them, wagging his bushy tail and aiming licks at their hands, barking happily, until Lily picked him up and hugged him too. Oh, my dear heart, John said. I'm so glad you're safe. Lily smiled in relief, then noticed the tears as they rolled down Robert's cheek. John and Lily pulled him into their embrace too. And Malkin, who was squashed somewhere between them, gave Robert the most enormous sandpapery lick on the end of his nose that made them all laugh. Thank you for everything, Robert, Lily said. You saved us. How did you know the bar would move? Robert shrugged. I remembered, he said. Remembered everything Dar taught me before he died. Not just how clocks fit together, but how people work too. How it takes quick thinking and a brave heart to win great battles. Tears glistened in Lily's eyes. Well, you have those in spades, she said. And so did your father, John told him. I didn't realise he was gone. He was a good man. He hugged them all once more, a proper bear hug this time, and kissed the top of Robert's head. And underneath his sobs, Robert felt a warm and tender feeling, a flickering flame of hope. Malkin gave a loud yip. Let's get out of here, he said, before more trouble arrives. Agreed. Come, lead on, Macduff. John took their arms and they ducked under the bell and limped across the iron gantry and out of the belfry, with Malkin trotting at their feet. Slowly, haltingly, the four of them descended the steps towards the base of the tower and the noisy chaos of New Palace Yard and the fire crews, ambulances and steam wagons that filled Parliament Square beyond. Wow, that was rather intense and stressful. I could feel my heart pumping as I was reading that chapter. Um, very, very good story to get you one chapter from the end and still get your heart pumping as you're reading it. Uh, I hope it did the same for you. I hope you enjoyed that chapter. I think in my head I know what's going to happen in the, or I think I know what's going to happen in the last chapter. Um, and I'm really sad to say that's the end. We've come to the end of it and um, we'll have no more cock heart, uh, which is really sad. But we will have something equally as exciting for you for the last couple of weeks. Um, so enjoy the last chapter tomorrow. And then don't forget to email us and let us know what you thought of the whole story um, when that's finished. <laughs>